Good afternoon. Um, my name is Andrew Kelly. I'm a product development chemist with Henkel for seven years now. And today I'm going to talk about how through our material usage in our products and throughout the casting process, we can look at balances, balancing sustainability and cost. We're going to start by looking at the application trends. What's you know, been driving the industry recently? What's going to be playing a more important part as we move forward? Um, and this will be not just the application of processes, but also uh, the implementation of modern alloys. After we've kind of set the stage of what we need to address, we'll look at the release agents themselves, where the current products are in terms of what they can do, how what we currently have may have challenges to fit into the, the changing market, and then how we can actually address those challenges. So in terms of application trends, as I say, this is processes and metallurgic, metallurgical kind of uh, topics. As we all know, the usage of aluminium within light vehicle construction is growing at a significant rate. Um, between 2010 and 2030, we see the, the volume of aluminium tripling. Um, and there's, there's two main drivers for this. One is general light weighting, making the vehicles uh, lighter, has benefits to both conventional ICE cars, so you know, extending uh, fuel efficiency. Um, but also, as the market share of, of hybrid and electro vehicles grows significantly, uh, we need to address weight concerns with vehicles due to the, the heavier nature of e-mobility vehicles. Structural parts themselves have grown in recent years in terms of the number of parts of a car we can actually make. Um, advances in alloy technology and processing technology means we can address these lightweight concerns and some of the e-mobility concerns by casting in aluminium. And this is a main reason why this, this volume increase is seen. Um, yeah, so in terms of, of the benefits, they're fairly self-explanatory and go along with, with what I've said about you know, fuel efficiency, range of electrical vehicles, just making more parts uh, quickly castable. But there are challenges. The new alloys themselves have challenges that are inherent to their metallurgical nature. The release agent, which is where we have our biggest, our biggest work, have to adapt uh, to be more suitable for structural parts. And while we may offer solutions just now for structural parts, there's going to be changes as we move forward to what we need to do to make sure we can keep uh, casting ever more complex and indeed larger structural parts. But in terms of sustainability and cost, there are clear benefits to this. Um, you know, the, the, pr the process in time is, is enhanced. The lightweight nature of the cars um, is obviously beneficial, both in terms of a carbon footprint perspective and in terms of a cost perspective. As I said, it's not just the complexity and the type of structural parts we're going to see more of, but also the size. And gigacasting is really a, a game changer in terms of, of what we're going to be able to do going forward. We're going to be able to make parts of cars that would in previous times require numerous welds, uh, individual castings, and a lot of time to make the part. So instead of making X amount of parts, with all the, the welding and bonding steps, with all the cleaning steps, we're now making single parts. And when I say gigacasting, you know, there's a lot of definitions for which number out there is really gigacasting, which is megacasting. It's all, you know, we're, we're early in the technology and it's confusing at times. But for the purposes of this, let's say anything above uh, five and a half thousand tons. Um, 
And yeah, this is going to really change how the process is run, but also how we as chemists develop solutions for the industry. As I've said, the benefits are, in terms of processing, pro, you know, time-driven, um, complexity-driven, cost-driven. You, you have less equipment costs if you just have one machine. The initial cost might be high, but having one machine that you can do so many more things with in a, a quicker cycle time compared to you know, your numerous parts. Um, this obviously has benefits when it comes to your carbon footprint and your cost. All kinds of things contribute to your energy costs. Welding is significant. Um, you've got a reduction in scrap. If you're only trimming one big part and not trimming dozens of parts, you're going to save scrap costs. There's clearly challenges here. This is a new technology. We have to be able to model these parts to allow them to, to be made properly so that we don't have you know, issues where the, the wall thickness varies significantly across a part. Um, and so the die design of these has to be optimized. The release agents we use has to be optimized. And how we actually get that release agent onto the die has to be optimized. On, in that light, microspray is going to become an increasingly um, important in the industry. Obviously, microspray has been around for a while, but the market share is still not where it's going to be uh, a few years from now. So by, by 2030, we estimate that something like 80% of castings will have shifted from conventional, you know, one part in 200 uh, dilutions up to 80% just spraying what your supplier sends you. Um, we're, we're all kind of aware of the benefits of microspray, um, but if, if, we're, if we're going to look at it on, on a giga scale, we're going to really have to optimize things like the cooling systems. Are we going to have dyes where, with all these wall thicknesses, um, you have to have the right cool ingredients at these parts. And so really, optimization of your microspray processes is going to be key. The general benefits of microspray um, are a lot to do with this cooling. You extend your dye life significantly. Um, up to possibly three times as long as with conventional spray. The reason being, when you spray a lot of water on the outside of a dye, you get a thing called thermal shock. And this affects the, you know, the stability of the, the metal in the dye. Using microspray also has benefits to things like cycle time. You don't have to spray all this water to cool the dye because the cooling's been done internally. And obviously, for us, a key driver is reduction in wastewater. Wastewater is, uh, for, in terms of sustainability, going to be a major topic going forward. We already know, even in Europe, there are major shortages every summer in water. Um, England, for instance, will have hose pipe bans. They will have in, in limited water usage in industry because the climate is changing and water usage is becoming more key. In terms of microspray's challenges, as I said with gigacasting, there's a lot of overlap here. The dye design has to, be, has to work in synergy with the spray. You need the spray system to be set up to work properly for the dye you're using. And again, from our side, the most important part is the release agent. And the release agent itself can cause problems with microspray, which on, during, yeah, using conventional spray might not be there. The final kind of topic I want to talk about before I go on to release agents themselves is the modern alloys. Uh, I mentioned at the start, talking about structural parts, that it's the development of new alloys which is really helping us shift more parts over to structural. Um, the, the current kind of market-leading alloy um, has a lot of iron in it, and iron forms into metallic phases within aluminium, weakening the parts. And so we you know, don't 
have the same elongation at break that we would have if it weren't there. But the iron does have benefits. Um, it, it means that you're less likely to stick in the dye. The dye kind of dissolves slightly in aluminium at high temperatures. And so you see, you see sticking if, if you don't have iron there. So what this means is when we think about product development, we have to think, how can we overcome these changes in the alloys as well? The alloys themselves, other than just um, having strength benefits, they also are what we call self-curing. They don't require heat treatment. Heat treatment of parts obviously is energy intensive. With growing energy costs, it's also cost intensive. And so if we can take out that cost from you and, and that energy um, impact, that's a benefit. There's also cycle time issues. If, if you have to go through heating, you, that's time you could be used doing something else. Um, the other benefits, you know, the, the, the parts themselves typically will be more dimensionally stable. As I say, with, without the, the, the iron there to cause these phases, then you are going to get more stable parts. As I've said, though, we do have some challenges, namely the sticking. Um, but there's also residues. And if, if you have a heat treatment process, you burn off the residues of whatever has been sprayed onto the dye. This is now more of a challenge. And so if you want uh, downstream uh, modification of the part, you need to take this into consideration. So our release agents have to think about all these changes to the industry, both in terms of process and in terms of the materials that we're using to cast, and think, how can we overcome these? This is kind of a uh, brief overview of sorry, uh, how a modern casting product looks. And this is product f for a long time. This is you know, some of these materials are, are probably not going to last with the new applications. What I'm talking about today is water-based products that are usually used for conventional dilution. I know there are pure oil products, but we're not going to we're not going to discuss that today. Um, in terms of of water-based products, you're typically going to get release from a silicon-type material, a uh, silicon or a siloxane, which will provide the primary release. You then have things which benefit this, add additional benefits. Uh, these can be mineral oils, although this is a more old-fashioned, cheaper kind of product. Waxes, these allow the metal to flow better through the dye. Um, and then synthetic oils. I've put it here as synthetic oils, but there's also some kind of naturally derived oils that can be used. These are, however, a lot more expensive. And so for the intents and purposes of this, I'll keep it as synthetic oils. Synthetic oils themselves can be used as the primary release agent if you formulate in the correct way. We also have a number of additives that can negatively impact sustainability, but are critical for the product. Um, so these could be wetting agents, or corrosion inhibitors, or probably most um, effect, uh, or having the greatest effect on sustainability and cost the biocides we use to protect the water-based emulsions. So in terms of uh, what we have to think about in our product design when we look at the process changes, there's quite a lot of things we need to think about. As I've said, we're moving away from post-casting heat treatment, and this will become a bigger issue with gigacasting. And so having residual silicon on your part is going to inhibit your ability to paint or weld or bond to it. And we've known this for a long time. I mean, silicon has a very low surface energy. And we know it's not compatible with a lot of, of bonding treatments, for instance. And we have taken steps to have silicon-free products in the past. But these products have to become more efficient, able to provide much higher levels of release while keeping the same effects on, on bonding downstream. Um, as I said with gigacasting, you've got various thicknesses of the parts. 
And so our products need to kind of operate in a greater temperature window, especially on kind of the low temperature end, when up to now, you know, you need a certain temperature to form a film on the die. We kind of need to shift the, the bottom end of the, the window a bit lower to deal for these temperature variances. As I mentioned when I was talking about silicon, build up on the parts is a it's more a residual thing, but there is more visible physical buildup you will see, particularly in products containing waxes. Um, waxes can clog nozzles. They can leave residues on parts and on your equipment. And so we need to look at ways to use waxes that will minimize these, these problems, especially as we shift to microspray, where you're spraying a more concentrated product than you would be traditionally. And as I said at the end, the, the alloys are stickier. They, they just are going to be stickier moving forward. And so this puts additional stresses on our release agents, particularly as we move away from siloxanes and silicons, which have the kind of highest performance in terms of release. So what can we do to overcome these challenges, but also offer sustainability benefits? So definitely, we have to be careful with the materials we're using. Um, we have to think of more modern materials. We have to think of things which can replace silicon without reducing the performance too much. We need to keep a similar level of performance, but not have these negative uh, downstream effects. We have to be clever about you know, the mixtures of raw materials we're using. To use different oils in combination or different waxes in combination to create synergistic effects, which you know can overcome things like dye complexity, alloy complexity, um, and really give us products which are more able to deal with a number of different challenges. Waxes themselves are a kind of special category here because there is there's such a greater propensity for buildup. Now we're going to concentrated spray. And this is an area we really need to focus on in, in either reducing or changing the waxes we're using to, to still give the lubricity needed for these large and complex parts, but not have any problems in terms of part cleaning. And obviously, as, as we move to more concentrated things, stability becomes important. The more things you have in a product, the more chances there is that something will interact with something else and kill your product before it's even out of the can, and we need to think about this. But in terms of overcoming these challenges, they give clear, clear benefits to both sustainability and cost. Um, if we have a product that allows you to not have heat treatment, you're saving on energy and cost. If we can use this for modern processes like gigacasting with their inherit, uh, inherent benefits, that's a benefit to you. If we can bring products which don't need to be, which mean your parts don't need to be cleaned as much, which means your equipment doesn't need to be cleaned as much, this has benefits in terms of cost and energy. It has benefits in terms of downtime, cleaning time. And these benefits all add up. And finally, we need to be able to quickly adapt to changes in the alloys and allow us to be able to cast with as wide a range of alloys as possible to, to you know, reach as broad a product part uh, portfolio as we can. I'll very quickly just talk about some additional benefits we can provide with our developments. As I mentioned earlier, biocides are kind of a big sustainability topic, especially in Germany with the water hazard class, uh, the Wasserverfahrungsklasse. Um, we have to meet customer demands in keeping this number as low as possible. And so using modern biocides or using maybe new emulsifiers um, to make our products um, but keep that number down, that's a real sustainability boost. Obviously, if we can source more uh, renewable materials, this helps our sustainability uh, footprint and also our customers. Um, and we can, we can add other things. If, if we can make corrosion protection that's better but isn't there, you know, if we can reduce the amount but give better protection, 
this gives the customer benefits in terms of scrapping, in terms of having to recycle parts. So there is a lot of additional benefits beyond just how we impact the process that our products can provide. So in summary, the pressure die casting industry from a chemist's point of view is giving us up is given up more and more challenges every year as our processes and our materials become ever more complex and the demand for sustainable and cost-saving solutions increases. We are able to innovate here to target these processes, to reduce your cycle times, to reduce your energy costs, to reduce cleaning time, your usage of water. We can, by changing things in our product, we can help you with that. Um, but at the same time, we need to be in good communication with our customers in making sure that our solutions are being applied in the correct way, with their dyes being set up correctly, with their, their spray systems being set up in such a way that our product can give the best benefits to the customer. I'd like to say thank you, and if anyone has any questions, I'm glad to answer.